Okay, Unit 9, Motivation and Emotion. If you're looking in your textbook and trying to find something, it is Unit 8 in the textbook. This is the first video. The video is going to look at theories of motivation. Um, the textbook reading is on pages 326 to 331. So the first thing is, what is motivation? Well, motivation is the specific need or desire that energizes behavior and directs it to a goal. Okay, it can include hunger, your thirst, or achievement that prompts goal-directed behavior. So it gets you to do a certain behavior. What are the sources for motivation? Motivation could be something that's biological. Okay, it could be something that your body needs. It could be something that's cognitive. It's something that your your mind wants, or or something that you, like a goal that you want to achieve, or it could be something that's more social. It's a pressure from the outside world. Okay, so they tried to figure out what really causes students to be motivated. So why do I have some students that are really motivated to get the A in the class, and I have other students that aren't even motivated to be in school? So they came up with what is known as the theories of motivation. Okay, there are five different theories or five different perspectives to explain motivation, and they include the following. Instinct theory, drive reduction theory, arousal theory, hierarchy of motives, and the incentive theory. Okay, you do have a chart in your packet, and I want to make sure that you write down all five of the theories and you're able to explain each one and give an example of each one. We will be using these in class. The first one is the instinct theory, and it's based off of evolutionary psychology. Okay, in the early 20th century, as the influence of Charles Darwin and evolutionary theory grew, okay, it was popular to classify behaviors as instinct. Instincts are complex behaviors that have fixed patterns throughout the species and are not learned. It's something that is essentially that we inherit or we just know how to do. It's an automatic disposition. It's innate or genetic. So I was trying to think of something that we just know how to do or something that we are just motivated in doing from birth. And this would be something like a reflex. We know how to just respond to something. Okay. Um, another instinct would be babies that are just, you know, they know how to search for food. That is something that is instinctual. They have this instinct to get them to do it. Okay. It did fall out of favor. So a lot of people questioned this and they said, no, this isn't something that um, is something that's very valid in terms of theory. And here's two reasons why it fell out of favor. It failed to explain human motives that are driven by incentives of money or that are learned. So yes, this theory is good in a sense that it explains things like reflexes, but it doesn't explain why we do things for money, okay, or we do things because we, we have a learned behavior, okay? Most of the important human behaviors, they say, are learned, okay? And since this is something that we're born with, it didn't really explain the behaviors, why we do them, because we learn a certain way, okay? Good thing, okay, it does provide us with a survival value, things for survival. Bad thing, it doesn't um, meet the complexity of most human behaviors. So again, it doesn't explain why we do things because of what we learn. So that's the instinctual theory. I link it a lot of times to the biological category, specifically evolutionary for the biopsychosocial, okay? The second theory is the drive reduction theory. This is based off of your bio, the, the bodily needs. This is going to fall under the bio category. Okay. When the instinct theory of motivation failed, it was replaced by the drive reduction theory. This is a physiological, a physiological, the idea that physiological need creates an aroused, motivated state. So something in our body is creating us to be motivated. There is a tension, a drive that motivates an or, um, organism to satisfy the need, okay? So we have a need. Our body is craving water, okay? 
the drive, maybe the drive is even that we're cramping up the tension. So we are going to reduce that tension by drinking water. Any biological need. Okay, another one is we have hunger pains. Because the need is food, the drive is hunger, that's the tension. And so we're going to eat to reduce that pain. So I would make sure you write down what the needs are. A need is something like food and water for your body. Okay, it could be sexual that you need. Okay, the drive then is going to be hunger, thirst. Okay, and then drive reduction behavior is going to be eating, drinking, okay, having sexual reproduction. Anything that your body needs. Okay, it could also be the need of warmth. The drive is going to be that you're you're shaking or your or your um, your body is, is, is going into convulsions because you're breathing. The drive then is going to be get, to get put a sweater on or to get clothes. Okay. The drive reduction theory, the physiological aim of drive reduction is homostasis. Okay. This is the maintenance of a steady internal state or balance. Your body needs to be balanced. Okay. It's the regulation of any aspect of the body's chemistry around a particular level. Okay, you want to make sure homostasis of your, um, let's say, your thirst is balanced. You want to make sure that your body has enough, it's hydrated enough. Same thing with hunger. An example of homostasis is literally staying the same. You want to be balanced. Is the body's temperature regulation system. So here's kind of how it works. Which works like a room thermostat. Okay, you want your thermostat to be balanced. Both systems operate through feedback loops. Sensors feed the room temperature to control the device. If the room temperature cools, the control device switches like a thermostat. Likewise, if our body temperature cools, blood vessels constrict to conserve warmth, and we feel driven to put on a sweater. Okay, so we're trying to balance our homostasis out. We're trying to make sure that we're reducing that tension um, that is being produced. Okay, pros, what's good, it's the primary drives are satisfied and homostasis is for bio needs, biological needs. Bad thing, it does not account for secondary motives, it does not account for money, achievement, power, why we enjoy playing in a certain sport, um, curiosity. So yes, it does serve that why we enjoy eating or why maybe we enjoy being attracted to certain people. You want to reduce that sexual frustration that you may have. However, it doesn't take into consideration that ability of why we do things to achieve or make money, gain power, which is the, the secondary motives. Incentive is another theory your book does not discuss, okay, but it is important to know. Okay, another thing is the incentive. It's a reward which can be positive or negative. Positive or negative stimuli that lures or repels us. Okay, incentives pulls us towards a behavior. Okay, it can be broken down into intrinsic or extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is internal. It's a desire to perform a behavior effectively for its own sake, personal desire, or you're driven. Okay, so you could have intrinsic motivation or incentives. These are things like, I'm going to school just to feel better about myself. Okay. Or extrinsic motivation, okay, extrinsic external factors, a desire to perform a behavior to receive a promised reward or to avoid a threatened punishment. So you're going to do it because you want candy, money, cars, stickers, or positive words, or you want to avoid maybe punishment. All right. Things that explain secondary drives, okay, explains money and candy, okay, the bad thing is it doesn't take into consideration um, the primary motives, the biological needs. Okay. It explains, it doesn't explain other theories also such as optimal arousal, which we're going to talk about. Okay, optimal arousal is the fourth idea here. Okay, it talks about that we are curious creatures that want to explore, and sometimes we don't think, do things for money or for personal enjoyment. Some things they believe we do it because we need to fulfill the, um, we, we need to get rid of the boredom that we have. 
Human motivation aims to seek optimal levels of being aroused. We want to be excited. We want to be happy. Um, it, we live in a stimulated environment, and we want to seek things like jumping out of planes. Right? So the arousal theory, the arousal theory also includes what's known as the yerkes dodson law. It states that there is a level of optimal arousal for our best performance on any task. The yerkes dodson law suggests that there is a relationship between performance and arousal. Okay, increased arousal can help improve performance, but only to a certain point. At the point when arousal becomes excessive, sometimes the, the performance diminishes. So yes, I like to do exciting things such as, let's say, jumping off a diving board. Okay, that's something that I really enjoy. I get bored swimming around, so I want to seek excitement, and I go off the diving board. However, if the platform were three um, stories high, that for me would be way too past my optimal arousal, and I would not increase doing the behavior because it was too far past the, 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 um, the arousal state. So here's kind of an image of it, right? Okay, once we kind of hit our peak, we're going to decline in performance because um, we're not going to be as thrilled to do it. The law was first described in 1908 by psychologists Robert Yerkes and John Dodson. They discovered that mild electric shocks could be used to motivate rats to complete a maze, but when the shocks became too strong, the rats would scurry around in a random direction to escape, and they wouldn't be excited to do it anymore. The experiment demonstrated that an increase in stress and arousal levels could help focus motivation and attention to a point on task, but there is a limit, and you can't push it too far. Okay, so I will be excited. All right, when, let's say, I were to jump off the diving board, but after a certain point, I don't want to jump off the diving board anymore because it's something that I'm terrified in. Okay, and then the last one, which is the hierarchy of needs. This is the looking at the humanistic approach. Okay, we talked quite a bit about this before. This is the cognitive category. Abraham Maslow, 1970, suggested that certain needs have a priority over others, so we're motivated because of certain things. Physiological needs of, of breathing need to happen first. Okay, the hunger is the core before you can seek other levels of motivation. So I would stop, pause, copy this, this pyramid down, and then maybe make sure that you know what each of the different levels is. The physiological is the first one. Okay, we need to satisfy our basic needs of survival before we can even begin to think about the next level. Okay, so we need to make sure that you're sleeping, you're eating, okay, breathing, all of that is fulfilled before we can worry about our safety. Safety then, okay, because if we're just complaining about being so hungry, we don't care whether or not we're, what's going on in our environment because we're so tired or we're so hungry that, that we can't move on. The next thing then is safety. Okay, um, your safety of your body, your safety of your family, your health, your property, your resources. Once set, safety is met, then you could really worry about um, who your friends are and maybe thinking about being in a relationship and thinking about having, um, you know, being a part of a group. If you're so worried about food and water, you're not going to really worry about whether or not you have friends. Is, is his, idea, his ideas about this. Once you then feel like you have a sense of belonging, then you feel like you can gain your sense of self-esteem. Okay, you can really understand who you are. You could be excited about achievement. But if you're so worried because your your country's in the state of war, you're not going to probably worry too much about whether or not you graduate because you're so worried about maybe your house being attacked at night. The last level then is you can reach self-actualization, which you have reached kind of your highest sense, you feel happy, you're creative, you're spontaneous, you have high self-esteem, you lack prejudice, you accept facts. You kind of have an idea of who you are in life. Okay, Maslow argued that after self-actualization, he believes kind of once you figure out who you are and, and some of your goals have been met, some people believe that they need to surpass that, which is called self-transience. It's the need to find meaning beyond one's identity, kind of thinking about, well, where do I go from here? What else is out there? Where can I, what can I achieve in the afterlife kind of thing? So some people argue Maslow 
after he kind of came out with his original theory, he believed that there may kind of like the Buddha, um, can I be beyond my self-identity? So kind of reviewing, make sure you know what motivation is and then make sure you know the different theories. Maybe you can name them by heart, um, list them, maybe understand um, how to define each one in an example of each because we will be reviewing these in class tomorrow.